the audio section. Now, today, probably for the remainder of the day, we're going to talk about concepts relating to audio files. As we're doing this discussion, we are going to um, we are going to um, hit some things that are common themes across all multimedia. So we may be bringing these up with regards to audio, but a lot of these statements that I'm going to make are, are, are general in nature. The first thing that's, that's a general truism is that the file size and the quality go together. That means that all things being equal, the higher the quality, the bigger the, the, the file size. Which kind of makes sense, right? If there was something that allowed you to get really small files that were absolutely great quality, there wouldn't be any discussion to this. We'd just go out and do it, right? This is a case of the old uh, saying, you know, you get what you pay for, where there's no free lunch, or however you want to put it. In other words, if you want increases of quality, that will more than likely translate to increase in file size. The file size of something really depends on sort of two factors, all right? And again, this is true for audio, but it is also true for other multimedia elements. But the file size usually is a function of the quality plus the manner of compression. In other words, certain image file formats may have the same image. It might be indecipherable, you know, to tell the difference between the quality of the two, yet one might be bigger than the other because one is stored in one format that for that particular picture does the compression more efficiently than another. So it's not all quality, but quality is uh, a general key. And if you hold this constant, like if you're only talking about one particular file type, like for images, if you're talking about um, you know, JPEG files, or for audio, if you're talking about MP3 files, then to be sure, the file size goes up and down with the quality. I want to define a couple terms here, because it is important to know this, because these are terms that, that we throw about that you very likely have, have all heard, but I want to make sure that we understand them. And we'll talk about them, again, first with audio, and but it applies to other areas as well. The two terms I want to talk about are analog versus digital. We all hear, and sometimes they'll, they'll say something about like multimedia, they'll say digital multimedia, or the digital arts, or something like that. What's the difference between analog and digital? What does analog mean, what does digital mean? If you can't think of it in terms of computer files, think of it in terms of watches. We'll talk about an analog clock versus a digital clock. Well, let's consider an analog clock and a digital clock. It is what time now? 127. A digital clock would show it like this. And for now, we're going to forget that there could be seconds on that. Well, we're just going to take it to the minute level. That's a digital clock. An analog clock, your, your plain old dial clock, would look like this. Oops. And so at 127, the hands would look like something like that. 
So, let's say it strikes 127 p.m. Digital clock flips over to 127. The analog clock flips, flips over to 127. Now, what's the difference between these two clocks as we travel towards 128? What's the digital clock do until we're at 128? Yeah, it flips over at 128, but between 127 and 128, what does it do? Nothing. Just sits there. All right? On the other hand, what does an analog clock do? An analog clock, if you look very closely, even forgetting whether there's a second hand or not, but an analog clock, you'll notice a minute hand very slowly moving until it hits 128. That minute hand is always moving. In fact, the hour hand is always moving. If, you know, even, even if you can't really see it. In other words, at 1 o'clock, at 127 rather, the, the, the hand of, a digit, of an analog clock isn't pointing to 1, it's pointing somewhere between 1 and 2. So, analog, when we talk about analog, we're talking about things that are continuous. With digital, we're talking about things that are discrete. Discrete means that there are, there's nothing in between levels, we'll say. We got, you know, re, you know, and it, the, what, what a level means depends on the context. But in a digital clock, there's nothing between the minutes shown. All right? Is 127 or is 128? In a continuous process, there's all those sweeping in between. All right? Now, okay, what does that mean when we get to digital audio? All right? When you hear me speak, all right, my voice makes Sound waves. Sound waves are slightly different, you know, are, are vibrations, if you will, fluctuations in pressure. I don't know, ask a physics professor, all right, in the air that hit your eardrum and you hear them and you interpret them as sound and you interpret them as words. If you are in a vacuum, all right, Besides the fact that we'd, we'd be dying any minute now from not having any air, but you wouldn't be able to hear any sound, right? Because there's nothing to transmit those fluctuations, all right? So it's vibrations in air. Now, those do you think are analog or do you think are digital? That's analog because it's continuous. So we draw a sound wave that looks like this. And this is a vast oversimplification, but the wave would look like that, where it's continuous. There isn't discrete points on there. And that's how original, the first recordings were made. The first recordings made were analog. Another word, or another word related to analog is analogy. So, the very first recordings were what? Were Thomas Edison, I think, talking into a, a gramophone, and there was a wax cylinder, and there was a needle, and as he spoke, his voice, the fluctuations of his voice moved the needle and etched a pattern on the wax cylinder, and then you could go back and play it back. In other words, what got etched onto the wax cylinder was an analogy of the actual sound wave. It was like the sound wave. All right? It was an analogy. It's not the same thing, but it's like it. And it was continuous. Of course, as recording improved, all right, the techniques improved. We didn't have the, you know, we didn't have the uh, wax cylinders, you know, anymore. 
Uh, and it's funny, you can actually hear it in the music uh, when some of these technologies improve. If you listen to real old records, for example, you don't hear, like, bass drums. Why not? Because the bass drums would have made the needle fly, <laughs> all right? Because that's too much of a difference in pressure, all right? But as recording technology improved and they went to different methods, namely audio tape, all right, we got around that problem. But it was still doing the same thing. On the tape, through magnetic patterns, you were getting an analogy of the sound wave. All right? And then it could be played back and, again, then converted back to, um, back to uh, uh, you know, air pressure, sound, and all that, and you can hear it. What is digital, then? Digital is discrete. Digital involves us periodically taking a sample of the wave and recording that. So you get a series of samples that looks like the original wave, but has some missing information in it, has gaps. Now, G, music I listen to on my CDs and other digital downloads sounds pretty good, you know, doesn't sound like there's gaps in it. Well, that's because if I make these dots, if I make the samples close enough together, your ears can't tell. Your ears can't tell the difference. It, 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 your mind just sort of blends everything in and you hear it like you would hear ordinary sound. All right? But this process is known as digitizing because what they can do is samples and convert it into a number. Maybe this number is 10. Just put 10 here. Maybe this number is 11. Maybe this number is 12. And this one is also 12. And so on down the line. All right. So they digitize it. They take these samples and they digitize it. And they're able to get to something that sounds a lot like the original recording. Now, let's compare and contrast the respective advantages and disadvantages to this. Audio purists swear that good, high-quality analog recordings are of a higher quality than digital recordings for a number of reasons, but because you know, these so-called experts in this area swear that you can hear, that, that the trained ear can hear the difference, and they typically say things like analog recordings sound warmer, sound richer, sound fuller. Now, for me, I don't, I guess my ears aren't trained enough because I can't tell the difference, but the fact is, is you do lose a little bit of information because you don't have a continuous wave, you just have samples. Now, to be sure, you have a lot of samples, but you just have samples at a certain uh, rate. Now, what about the problem with this then? The problem with this is about duplicating this, right? Because if I have a set of numbers, I can easily duplicate those numbers forever, right? So any copy I make is going to just be a copy of those numbers. So in theory, it'll be, well, in theory and in practice, it'll be the same quality as the original recording. Now, consider an analog recording, though. An analog recording. 
recording is typically made on some physical media, not on uh, a computer. Because of that, what happens as the physical media gets damaged over time? Tapes stretch a little bit. You know, record albums get nicks in them. The actual recording process introduces additional noise to it. So each copy of an analog degrades in quality, where each copy of a digital stays constant. Okay? Now, there's two ways that we can improve the quality of a digital recording. What do you think the two ways are to improve the quality of a digital recording? One, you might be able to guess the other. You might have to read between the lines. Yes? Use a high-quality uh, disc. I think it's like gold discs. Well, I don't know if that would, I don't know if that really matter. You don't think? Uh, not, yeah. Maybe it preserves it. Yeah, it might preserve it longer, but yeah. Use higher sampling rate? Yeah, sample more often, right? For example, if we imagine a ridiculous situation where we sample only one quarter of the time. Our wave might look something like this. You can tell there's less information there. There's one quarter of the information there, so the quality is likely going to be not particularly good. All right? So, one of the things you can do is you can improve the sample rate. What's another thing that you can do to improve the quality? The other, the other thing that you can do that you have to sort of read between the lines is, is for each one of these points, store bigger numbers. Right? Storing bigger numbers allow you to um, capture slighter changes in tone, all right? And that will result in bigger quality. So if we store, let's, uh, let me try to do the math. If we, do, if we store eight bits per each sample, that will be 256 possibilities. Let me find the calculator here. I can do this on my head. All right. Eight bits is 256 possibilities. So I could store 256 sound colors, if you will. If I go up to storing 16 bits per sound, I now can store 256 times 256, which I think is in the neighborhood of 65,000 and change. If I store three bytes for each sound sample, I would have 65,000 times 256, and so on and so on and so on. So the more bytes, the more information you store about each point, the better the sound quality is going to be. So your choice for improving quality is this. One is sample more often. So you can increase the sample rate. That will give you better quality. The other thing you can do is you can record with a higher resolution. You can record a higher number of bits. That's more information about each sound. So to improve the quality of this, I can get more information about each sound, store it to a finer degree, or and or I can record more dots. Think of it in terms of the digital clock. What could I do to make my digital clock more precise? I could store more numbers about the time. Right? I could store hours, minutes, and seconds. Then it would be more precise, right? It wouldn't be just 127 or 128. It would be 127.01, 127.02. Now, I still wouldn't know where it was between 01 and 02, but I could add tenths of a second, or hundreds of a second, or like in the Olympics, down to thousands of a second. It could get to the point where I am storing so much information about each time snippet 
that is virtually not being able to be distinguished from, from analog, right? Because if you watch the Olympics, you, your eye can't follow probably the hundredth of a second either. You might not even be able to follow the, the tenths of a second position in it because it's going so fast. It may appear as though it's continuous. And that's the idea here. So we can either store a denser series of dots, take more samples, or we can store more information about each dot and therefore get a more precise reading on that. Now, how good does the quality of audio need to be? It needs to be as good as it needs to be, right? And there are some things that you can do to improve or lower the quality of a recording. We talked about two already. Another thing you can do relates to compression, all right? And there's two sorts of compression that you can apply to an audio recording. Um, you can uh, uh, you can apply a compression of frequency, and you can apply compression of volume. What do those do? Those allow you to store less numbers about a particular sound, so you can store it in a smaller area. Now. If you were recording me, all right, my voice, I hope, isn't a total monotone. I probably go up and down a little bit. But I certainly don't go up and down as much as an opera singer would go up and down, right? Or an orchestra, or any kind of music. You know, music is going to have very low lows and very high highs, whereas I'm going to be somewhere in the middle. Well, guess what? If I can compress that and filter out, actually, Strictly speaking, this would be compression, this would be filtering. But if I can filter out the high highs and the low lows, you're not going to lose anything in my voice. What are you going to lose? You might lose the ambient hum of the computer that you might not even be able to hear, really, but it's there. All right? Or you might lose other sorts of sort of noise that really isn't relevant to the message. And if I would really get this excited and my voice went up, well, you're not going to really lose anything um, if it compresses the, the, the and, and, and my pitch is a little different, or right? so my voice sounds a little different than it was originally uh, to, to be heard. The other thing you can do is compress volume. And this is where a lot of audio purists criticize digital recording. There's a lot of folks that talk about the poor compression of the typical uh, digital recording that you download. In terms of if you listen to uh, an orchestra, there's a big gap between the quietest moments and the loudest moments. Well, guess what? If you push everything towards the middle, you can get by with storing less information about each sound, and therefore you can get by with less space. So, how much information we store about each point, how many points we have, and can we limit what we store about each point based either on frequency or volume? Those are all ways that we can affect the quality. What I'd like to do is take a look at some of the resources we have available about audio and then talk about resources, and then I have a couple about Audacity. Audacity is a good audio program that's absolutely free. So it's the one that I would suggest you using. That being said, feel free to use, if you have another tool that you've been using and you'd rather use that, that's okay. All right. Wikipedia has a good overview of digital audio. And they talk about the sampling rate, and they talk about the quantization of the signal. And by quantization, they mean uh, storing the, the, the numbers, or storing the sound as a number. In this case, they're using 4-bit, which allows for 16 possibilities. There's a lot more information here. Um, actually, I think that graph was the relevant thing. 
I think that puts it in a good way how a, a wave could be digitized. You take samples periodically and you would choose how many numbers you want to store. So the wave sort of gets, you know, the wave which would be recorded analog this way would sort of get slightly changed. The other resource is this one, and parts of this are very technical, but parts of this are good too. This, for example, like when we talk about Nyquist theorem, all right, probably not going to worry about that one. But sampling rates are a good one, and they talk about the typical sampler rates. 32K would be 32,000 samples per second. That would be sufficient to record voice and sufficient for earlier generations of digital audio tapes. All the way up through 192,000 right, samples per second. Your typical CD is at 44,000 samples per second. And quantization. They talk about, again, <coughs> and again, they talk about, this is really the difference. In a analog recording, you can record between numbers. In digital recording, it has to be this or it has to be that. And your recording software has to pick one of the two. Now, if there's enough numbers, that gets to be a very small difference. But it will be a difference by definition. All right? It won't be exactly the same. And they talk about, uh, again, uh, to, to improve it, larger sample word sizes, which means more information per sound. All right? Okay. Your assignment. Next time, or next week, on Monday, we'll go over the recording software of, of Audacity. Your assignment is to create a podcast. And what is a podcast? A podcast is... It can either be audio or video. For the purposes of this class, it will be an audio podcast, though. Uh, what you are to do is you're to pick a topic that relates to multimedia. All right? But you should go beyond the basics. Pick one aspect of it and really go beyond just the basic introductory material, the sort of material that I discuss in class. So if you're doing it on typography, you know, don't go and do it um, about definitions of what a seraphon is and what a sans seraphon is and, and that sort of thing. Do it in, in more detail. Experiments that people have done with dynamic type, for example, might be good. All right? That's something we haven't talked about this class, in this class. Tag clouds, we haven't talked about those in class. That might be a good thing to do. And so the point is, is I want you to go beyond just the basics. So you pick really pretty much whatever topic that you want, provided it relates to multimedia, and provided that uh, it goes beyond the stuff that we talked about in class. All right. You'll then design it. By design it, I mean make an outline. There's time restrictions. I think the total should be between five and seven minutes, I think is what it says. I don't recall. Is this in three, yeah, no. three to five minutes? OK. Uh, that's three to five of your material. Uh, we'll talk about what you have to add on to it in a second here. All right, so you'll re figure on three to five minutes, which really is not much time at all. All right, so don't pick a huge topic. All right? You will then record it, and you will then edit it to include two little sound snippets that I've prepared, which are just sort of like an introduction and a closing. So I want to make sure that you are proficient in using the editing software. I don't want you to just turn on a microphone, talk, turn it off, save the file, and be done with it. I want you to actually do some editing. Now, we'll talk more next.